um, warm welcome everyone so we are going to see the indian polity previous year questions we are going to take a few previous year questions from indian polity some selective questions and then we are going to do the answer discussion in this video <clears throat> so i'm rajkumar faculty of shankar ias we are not going to take up uh, one question paper full of polity like that we are going to select uh, selected some 20 questions from the year 2011 to that of 2022 so in the span of 12 years about 20 selective questions is taken from various years from just a limited set of topics not from variety of topics a limited set of topics so that we can have a better idea of those areas but to be precise i can tell you these are all the areas 20 questions has been taken up so local governments panchayat raj municipalities pesa act etc and then scheduled and tribal areas direct to principles of state policy it's in a very limited way you can even skip this topic because it is in limited way one question direct to principle is a little bit connected other than the dpsp we are not going to focus much and the questions that come from schedules to the constitution of india and the constitutional and non-constitutional body statutory body like that so i can tell you four areas broadly direct to principle slight connection one question is a little bit connected with the dpsp in this entire stretch of 20 questions we are going to see 20 questions uh, yeah and before we start this one what's going to be the objective of this discussion the objective of this discussion is twofold i can tell you number one we are going to see the answer key why this answer if this is the question then what's the answer and how we can choose that answer is it a factual question or it requires conceptual understanding or if it requires a conceptual understanding can we apply any kind of logical reasoning to eliminate some answers or pick some answers can we do any such kind of a uh, is there any kind of such kind of possibilities are there we'll look into this so we'll make an answer discussion finding out a key and the best way to arrive at a key that we will see Number two, we look for the rationale of the question. Why this question is asked? That's the very important thing. Um, so, why a question is asked in UPSC province? If you ask that question, particularly for the subject like polity and uh, environment and all, they have a lot of current affair rationale will be there. So, if you look for reasoning, <clears throat> why this question has come? If you go and search for uh, answer for this question. You will come to see that basically all the polity prelims questions could be categorized into three broad categories. One is questions coming up from the static material, no other ration. We said in syllabus, we asked you to prepare static material, you would have went through, so just answer. This kind of questions will be there straight away from the static material. And second type of questions is that syllabus related current events will be going on. So it happened in the last one to one and a half year, it was in news. So newspaper is the material from there. We took this question. This kind of a thing will be there. Set of questions, you can put them into this category. Third set of questions. It was, it was a current affair discussion on the subject matter. But the question was not from framed from the current affair. The current affair news article is just like a trigger. You have to get triggered and get into the static material. Go for the background. Read the static material with the basics, fundamentals, background etc etc from the static material so we frame question from that static material which is based from the current so likewise we can split into three broad categories directly from static from current affair current affair based static yeah so likewise we can categorize broadly uh, any single polity question every single question polity question you can put them into any of the three categories you can put them into. There is no fourth category I can say. All the questions you can accommodate in three categories. So the objective is this. We will find the key. We will try to find the key. And then we will find the rationale for the question. And this is very important because one more reason is there. This question paper analysis of uh, previous year of preliminary is very, very significant, very important because the prelim syllabus is only very indicative. So for Indian polity, we have to read nearly some thousand pages around, including current affairs for one to one and a half year. We have read current affairs as well. And uh, when we read that, it's a huge area to be covered. But if you look into the syllabus, it's just one and a half line. That's the syllabus. 
the syllabus is very broad it's very brief it's too general it's just an indicator that's all but lot has to be interpreted from the syllabus and you have to prepare a lot of sub areas yeah, from the broader topic of main syllabus so which means uh, necessarily it's mandatory you have to go through the previous questions to get an idea about the subject how the questions are framed so basically a syllabus tells you what you want to read but previous year questions will tell you how you want to read what you want to read so going through the previous year questions is very significant so that we'll do this in this exercise i'll just make a beginning 20 questions and then you can do the rest of the questions by yourself uh, so first before we start we'll just go through the syllabus it's very indicative i told so the syllabus topic is indian polity and governance just only five topics is mentioned if you look into those topics first two one is constitution now this is a much bigger word that's a very broad word that's a true general word constitution of india constitution of india we have lot of things and the world's lengthiest constitution is in fact indian constitution so it's a very broad topic and then if you see the remaining four topics that is mentioned they are so specific and precise they are so sharp so political system yeah so the word has to be interpreted what is political systems what does india for the syllabus is basically it's concerned with the indian only so you have to look at from the indian perspective so what does indian political system if you ask means uh, we have democratic system representative democracy model parliamentary democracy parliamentary system we follow and then uh, federal system we follow with striking unitary features we have and then this is written constitution based system constitutionalism is there in india rule of law is in india so these are all the basics of indian political system so all those ideas theoretically conceptually what are all the characteristics of a parliamentary system what are the characteristics of a democratic system constitutionalism means what and about the concept so likewise this area is mostly a conceptual area and uh, you must be preparing the areas that i have listed no no these are all the areas you must be preparing and if you see the syllabus was published in 2 i mean the question started to come from the syllabus 2011 onwards and if you see uh, since 2011 you will recognize that almost every year having at least one question from those areas that i have listed so political system and then panchayat raj word is specific look at it there is constitution there is part 9 inside inside the constitution part 9 deals with the panchayat raj though the panchayat is naturally if, if you are asked to prepare constitution definitely you will be preparing panchayat raj anyway but what made upsc to go one step ahead one step extra and to mention this panchayat raj means they are telling you this one prepare constitution you will be preparing panchayat raj anyway but pay special attention to panchayat raj that's what upsc is saying so panchayat raj you have to make a special attention to this topic local governments i can tell you broadly don't restrict only into panchayats and understand it as local governments and prepare the whole local governments and then public policy all the policy decisions made by the government it may be executive decision any ministry is making any important executive body is making or parliament is passing an act any program has come any scheme has come you can see that this is mostly current affair right it's mostly current affair i can tell you about uh, if i want to put it in number i can tell you more than 90% of the questions from public policy could be current affair but if you see the classification of questions if you see uh, when the previous year questions are classified on subject basis you will come to see that the public policy questions which normally you should have put in uh, policy area but normally you will see that if suppose the policy is related to economics they'll keep it as economic subject the public policy is related to environment they'll keep that question into environment but broadly you can see that syllabus topic is saying you to prepare the public policy and then next to rights issues that's why you can see that every year the concept of right you must be aware and closer towards the concept of liberty you must be aware and then fundamental rights not just fundamental rights other rights in the constitution and various other statutory rights and even questions coming from uh, human rights united nations uh, charter of human rights it goes outside also the rights you have to and you can see that questions coming up from rights forest rights act or the provision yeah this and all questions coming up yeah so these are all the specific topics anyway and then they put a safe word etc yeah it's the most safest word you psc can put now let's get into the weightage of the subject so totally in the last 12 years so we had 169 questions in total this may not be precise i would have i might have missed four or five questions overall in this 12 years 
So maybe one or two questions, etc. Adding, and I can tell you, it can go up to 175 in the last year, last 12 years. This is when the present syllabus questions are asked. So that's why we took from 2011 to 2022. And you can see that the lowest number of questions came in 2016, just seven questions. But one year, it's going up to 22 questions in a year out of 100. So you can understand the weightage of the polity. Approximately, you can say 12 years, 169 questions, approximately 15 questions in a year, roughly, you can say that. Yeah, that's the weightage of the subject. And now we are going to not, we are going, we are not going to see from all the areas one one sample question but the agenda of this video is going to be just questions from the four areas little bit connected with one area dpsp uh, and that these four areas we have, we have taken selectively 20 questions and we are going to discuss answers for those and one more thing i have to tell you what is the rationale behind choosing this 20 questions is there any particular reason why this specific 20 question is picked up there is no such reason the only condition is that the four areas, we have to take the question. That's the only condition. And randomly questions has been picked. Okay. So we'll start seeing the questions one by one. Let's start with the question number one. So this is how it goes. The question came in 2011. The Constitution 73rd Amendment Act 1992, which aims at promoting the Panchayat Raj institutions in the country, provides for which of the following? So 73rd Amendment Tax Cons, what it has contributed to, what it has created. That's what the question is. Constitution of District Planning Committees, whether it has created that. Okay, number two, state election commissions to conduct panch all panchayat elections. And number three, establishment of state finance commissions. Okay, select the correct answers using the codes below. One only, one and two only, two and three only, one, two and three. Okay. Whether 973rd Amendment created state election commission? Yes. Whether it has established state finance commissions? Yes. Whether it has constituted a district planning committee? No. Okay. Why? This is a factual question. It's a pure factual question. Fact is involved. Okay. I have not went through the facts, but I know the concept. I've read the area. Of, uh, Two, three times I've read the area, but still I don't remember. But even then, you can choose the answer if you apply a little bit of logic. Great. Panchayat elections is conducted by State Election Commission. You all know that 73rd Amendment Act 1992, it inserted Part 9, Article 243 to 243O. Oh. And then 74th Amendment Act, the immediately consecutively it was passed, immediately successively to this. 73rd Act. The 74th Amendment Act inserted Part 9A. Article 243P to 243Z-G is inserted. But if you see the State Election Commission, what does it do? It's basically any student who has went this, went through this local government, yeah, had a basic conceptual understanding of local government, idea about the local government, he would say that State Election Commission conducts Two elections, basically. In fact, State Election Commission itself has been creation in the Indian Constitution in 1992 only. Because there is no such office before. We had Election Commission of India. But State Election Commission is new creation in India, just three decades back in 1992. Why it has been created? It is created with exclusively one agenda, to conduct elections for the panchayats and municipalities. We know that. So State Election Commission conducts elections for panchayats and municipalities. This is the basic idea of any student who is preparing local government must be knowing. So if this body is conducting panchayat elections, naturally it should have been created by 73rd Amendment, right? For example, you create panchayats, but without telling who is conducting panchayat elections, the part nine would be incomplete. The part of Indian, the part of local governments, the part of panchayat would be incomplete unless you create a body called the State Election Commission. Similarly, State Finance Commission also, the same manner only. So it has been, so both has to be created definitely by 73rd Amendment, we can apply a reasoning. Whereas with this question, with respect to district planning committees, okay, you do not know whether in part 9 it is there or part 9A it is there, even if you do not know. But just basically, if you look into it, what does a district planning committee do? It basically collects the plan or uh, basically it uh, makes a plan. Uh, it creates a plan for the development of the district area. 
by collecting plans from the panchayats and municipalities in the area. So the district planning committee the default function is that it has to it has to make a plan development plan for the whole district based on the uh, the plans made by the panchayats and municipalities in the district. So without creation of municipalities, district planning committee is meaningless. So district planning committee is created under part 9A after the creation of municipalities. I mean, municipalities has to be there. Then only district planning committee will become meaningful. So, and before you create municipalities, creation of district planning committee is also meaningless. You cannot create it. So part 9 alone is not enough. I mean, creation of Panchayat Raj alone is not enough to make this district planning committee to come into effect. So, so if you know the basic the very first and primary fundamental function of the district planning committee, you will recognize that it involves functions that is related to the municipalities. So without the municipality being created in the constitution, there is no possibility of 73rd amendment creating district planning committee. If you apply that logic also, you can find an answer. Okay. So this is the key. So answer is one and two only. Answer is B for this question. Okay. Now, why this question has come? Is there any rational for it? I can tell you one thing. As far as local governments are concerned, if any question is coming from the Panchayat Raj or from the local government area, don't look for a reason. Is there any specific reason? Was it in current affair? Was it not in current affair? Or it is a current affair? Let's not look into that question. I can tell you if this question is coming from the political system or uh, from the Panchayat Raj or from the rights issues or from the public policy, there is no need to uh, find a rational for it. It's there straight away mentioned in the syllabus prepare and come. What else could be a better rational than uh, the syllabus saying it specifically? So don't look for a rational. But even then I can tell you there is one rational remotely we can say that. Uh, this act was passed in 1992. And um, it was passed on 24th April 1992. From 2010 onwards, the Ministry of Panchayat Raj started organizing April 24 of every year, 2010 onwards, they started doing it. April 24 of every year as a National Panchayat Raj Day. So that was celebrated. 2010, it was celebrated. The question came in 2011, not in 2010. Because the celebration was done within less than one month, 2010 prelims came. So the next prelims basically is 2011 prelims. So in that sense also when the and and throughout the year there were newspapers making a lot of discussions as well regarding the panchayat raj so when panchayat raj day is celebrated naturally you expect that thing no so that is how it was so yeah, other than that I, I i don't find any rational for this question it's there in syllabus that's why we prepare it but i can tell you um the local government devaluation of powers and finances up to local levels this topic is mentioned in your main syllabus so on 25th year of this act coming into force, 1992, the 25th year is 2018, we had one uh, mains question. And then uh, 30th year, that is uh, 22, 2022, on 30th year also there was a mains question. 25th year, 25th year question, 30th year question. So you very naturally you have to look for... Uh, um, the Panchayat Raj Act has come, local government has been created, the dream has been, uh, a little bit of dream has been achieved. Then very naturally, 25 years, Silver Jubilee, you have to look back. Yeah, you have to make an assessment. If you see 2018 mains question, it asks for assessment of the functioning of Panchayat Raj in India. Or if you see the 2022 questions, it asked about uh, the significance of local government or something like that. So anyway, that's mains questions anyway. But I can tell you, so this question makes me to go there. So the question, second one, the fundamental object of Panchayat Raj system is to ensure which among the following? People's participation in development, question came in 2015, political accountability, democratic decentralization, financial mobilization. Okay. Um, one, two, and three only. One, two, three, and four is there. So all the options comes, or only two options comes, or three options comes. So the options are very closer. So it's a tight question. I can tell you when this question came, before UPSC published the answer key, 
there was a debate going on. This is one of the controversial questions throughout India, not a controversial question. A mixed answers were coming up. Yeah, some experts are predicting, saying that uh, all the four comes. Some says that one, two, and three comes, but not four. Some are saying only one and three comes. So there was a debate because this question involves a little element of uh, subjectivity is involved. But I can tell you, if you pay a close attention, uh, you can make an objective analysis as well. I mean, I can say the right between the right choice and the wrong choice. A thin line runs. So that's why this question is a little bit uh, a tough question to arrive at a conclusion. But if you make an honest analysis, I can tell you objective analysis is perfectly possible. Let's see how it is. Look at this one. Why the local Panchayat Raj system has been created? 73rd Amendment created Panchayat Raj system. Why it has created? What is the rational behind it? The fundamental rational behind is democratic decentralization. Nobody will doubt that. So three always comes 100% for sure. Like the same, it is not for the financial mobilization. Local governments doesn't mobilize any resources at all. In fact, they themselves, for their own financial resources, they are dependent on the government, state government for them to enable them to mobilize more funds. State governments have not devolved enough power for the local governments to mobilize more funds. So financial mobilization doesn't come, whereas democratic decentralization, surely it comes. So which means four we can eliminate and three has to come. So which means either this, so this is not, so either it can be one and three only. And uh, so this is also not one, two and three one. So now the question is about two which is political accountability. That's where the most of the debates went in India before UPSC published the, result, published the answer key. People's participation in development also comes. That's for sure. Uh, there is no doubt in that. In fact, I can tell you the two fundamental reasons why the local government Panchayat Raj has been created in India. Is these are the two things. One is democratic decentralization and people's participation in development. It empowers people. It enables them to take part in the democratic uh, developmental process. It empowers weaker sections. If these things and also because SCST reservation is there, women reservation is there. So it is empowering weaker sections. In that sense, it is it's fulfilling the objective. And most of the development plans, development schemes of central and state governments is executed through the local government. So for people's participation and what is the primary function of the local governments. Constitution indicates two functions for them. One is preparing plans for economic development and social justice and implementing plan schemes related to uh, the economic justice, like social justice and economic development with respect to those items mentioned in the 11th schedule. So when you just basically go through the two functions that is granted to the panchayats by the constitution, you will come to recognize that they do a lot of development related activities and it enables people's participation in development so i can tell you keep it in your mind democratic decentralization and people's participation in development are fundamental objectives of panchayat raj that's okay what about this political accountability political accountability basically accountability means what the politicians are made the leaders are democratically elected the leaders are they are accountable to the electorate who has elected them that's basically accountabilities, this political accountability. Other local governments created possibilities for accountability. If you, if this question is asked, yeah, five years once election is coming up, so what else could be the testing of the accountability? What is basically accountability? Accountability means answerability, that I do something, I'm answerable to you. You ask me a question, I have to answer you. This is accountability. And this is just one aspect of accountability. Second, accountability is that when I do wrong, when I go wrong, uh, I have to be punished also. Sanctions has to be imposed on me. So I'm answerable to you. And when I deviate, when I do wrong, then I'm, I'm going to get the sanctions from you. If these two conditions are fulfilled, you call it as a political accountability, right? Broadly. Whether if that has been come up because of Panchayat Raj, if you see, it means that has not happened. Look at this one. Basically, they don't have that much bigger powers. The real powers is not at interested to the local governments by the state legislatures. And it's the biggest challenge even today. 30 years have been completed. Panchayat Raj in India. 
but still now we are discussing about uh, the um, non devolution of enough financial powers and enough political powers to the local government but still it is a debatable area so with no real power interested to them where does the question of where does the significance of making the leaders accountable to the people comes into whether we have brought any right to recall the representatives right to uh, remove the representatives if suppose they do wrong this kinds of things and all it's not even discussed in india it's not even considered as a priority in india what is our priority today is to enable them to function as unit of self government by mobilizing their own financial resources by having more and more powers this is what under debate today uh, about uh, making them accountable to the people and what you also know that most of the uh, powers related to the panchayats areas and all still exercised by the district administration district electorate plays a very important role and they they as they does a lot of things functions and all those things so, so the real power is with the district administration still not with the various departments of districts but not still with the panchayats so naturally the question of political accountability doesn't come i can tell you if you genuinely look into whether panchayat raj has achieved people's participation in development in india yes it has politicized them it has made it has endowed them with sense of responsibility it has uh, enabled the people to uh, even if you see that balwantrai mehta committee which is the root origin later lm singhvi committee it, it ended in with lm singhvi committee and this balwantrai mehta committee why it was constituted they to they looked into the community development program and national extension service scheme how they are practically implemented so what is the best measures that could be suggested to implement these kinds of schemes in a better way so basically to implement the development schemes we need a local government that's what balwant rai concluded so the basic idea for creation of local governments itself to bring development so that's why democratic decentralization this one you choose whether it has created financial mobilization if you say no then you have to say no the same logic you can apply and you can say no to the political accountability also so honestly looking into the indian panchayat raj a genuine student will say yes it has brought this one this has this one but this has not been brought by the 73rd amendment not by the panchayat raj that's what a student will conclude into and that's what upsc is also expecting this is the answer so once again as i said there was a little subjectivity involved a thin line that distinguishes between this political i mean not choosing this one choosing this one between that a small lines runs there but if you apply this logic end of the day you can come to the conclusion that one and three only not the political accountability so this also must come yeah second question is over let's go for the third question consider the following statements the minimum age prescribed for any person to be a member of panchayat is 25 years know that that's 21 years that's wrong a panchayat reconstituted after premature dissolution comes only after continues only for the remainder period that's also true both statements are correct only which of the following statements are correct so both one and two it's a basic factual question straight away from the fact straight away from the material if you are familiar with the basics facts it's a fact based question anyway so what's the first uh, thing uh the minimum age prescribed for any person to be a member of panchayat is 25 years you see that there is no qualification as such as prescribed by the part 9 of the constitution in the panchayat raj part it rather it says disqualifications is mentioned but not the qualification so what does it say about disqualifications it says that so uh, it says that what are the qualifications required for a member member of legislative assembly broadly the same thing goes here but to mla it is 25 years but for member of to become a member of local government to punch, to contest in local government panchayat or municipality elections 21 years so it's not 25 you must be knowing and then as i said it is a basic fact and a panchayat reconstituted after the premature dissolution continues only for the remainder period that is straight forward that is given in the material it's right forward it is there in the constitution it is mentioned uh, local governments <clears throat> throughout the state all local government elections is conducted at one go the panchayats and municipalities generally that is how it is conducted 
So if suppose any panchayat is dissolved, so once the panchayat election is conducted, panchayats are constituted in a state, municipality is constituted, it functions for five years. And before the expiry of term of five years, next panchayat elections has to be conducted for the whole state, the new panchayats has to be elected. That's what it's saying. What if suppose a panchayat gets discontinued in mid of the five year duration, say for instance, after two years of functioning, one panchayat is dissolved. So the election will be conducted for that panchayat alone, the dissolved panchayat alone, new election will be conducted and new uh, panchayat will be constituted for that body. After the dissolution, within six months, the election has to be conducted. That's what the constitution says. And if the panchayat gets dissolved, a premature dissolution of a panchayat happens and just six months left for the whole state panchayat election, then there is no need to conduct the election for that specific premature dissolved panchayat. That's also constitution says. So straightforward from the material, so only for the reminder period, yeah. For example, two years when panchayat is dissolved and within six months, say for instance, at the end of two and a half year, that panchayat election is conducted. It functions only for the next two and a half years. It doesn't function for the whole, whole set of next five years. Because once the five year is completed for the whole state, uh, new panchayat elections has to be conducted. <clears throat> so it functions basically only for the reminder period. Straightforward from the book actually basically. Yes. <clears throat> so this is the key. And if you look for the rational, why this question has come, if you find an answer for this question. I can tell you one thing, the question came in 2016. <clears throat> uh, the Panchayat Act was passed in 1992. It came into force in 1993. <clears throat> the act gave one year time for all the states uh, to amend all their panchayat acts to make them in line with the part nine order provisions. So most of the states acts were passed by 1994. And the elections in most of the states for their panchayats, the first general elections for panchayats started to be conducted from uh, 1995 onwards. So that's why you see that most of the states in 95 la panchayat elections were conducted or 96 la it, conduct, it got conducted. That's why you see that every year, uh, every time, uh, the period of uh, the years that ends with five, the year ends with zero, you will have a lot of uh, panchayat elections going on in various states. You will be getting them in yours. So 95, we can say, is first general election. First panchayat elections in most of the states are 96 and the next in 2000 or 2001 and the next one in 2005 or 2006 next one is 2010 or 2011 next one is 2015 or 2016 so i can tell you it's four to series of elections that was going on various states i can tell you 2015 a number of states i still remember uh, th this year before this 2016 2015 so many states uh, so many states went with the elections. Gujarat, there were elections. Karnataka, there were elections. And Jharkhand, there was elections. Himachal Pradesh, there was elections. Uttar Pradesh, there was Uttar Pradesh, there was elections. I know the Uttar Pradesh. So these states and all 2015 series of Panchayat Raj elections. So repeatedly, the newspaper, the Panchayat elections was in news. And one more historic thing happened. A significant thing happened in 2015 also. The, uh, the Haryana state government, uh, they made additional uh, qualification. The Haryana Panchayat Raj Act was amended by the Haryana legislature and uh, a qualification of uh, educational qualification was prescribed to contest in the constitution doesn't fix any education qualification. It simply says 21 years of age and then uh, not disqualified under any act made. Uh, and the disqualifications that is for the MLAs will be applicable. Only these things are said. Whereas uh, Haryana um, state legislature said minimum there should be certain education qualification to contest in panchayat elections. The validity of it was challenged in the court and Supreme Court upheld 2015 December, six months around before this exam, this question coming up in exam, the qualification was repeatedly in use. Age only is in uh, constitution is there. There is no education qualification and all. But Supreme Court upheld the Haryana Act to be valid. So it was in use. Panchayat elections was in use. The qualifications to become Panchayat members was in use. Throughout 
but i can tell you even you don't want to look for this kind of a rational for panchayat raj question syllabus says panchayat raj prepared that's all what else we have to check for and then we'll go for the next question local self government can be best explained as an exercise in 2017 it came federalism democratic decentralization administrative delegation direct democracy as we all know so it is democratic decentralization there is no doubt in that that's what first looking of the answer options itself we'll choose democratic decentralization but still uh, any doubt you have means possibly you will have a doubt on uh, whether this this and this i think you will eliminate it at the first instant i mean uh, a good student will naturally eliminate this administrative delegation could be the least possible answer or it's an impossible answer even i can tell you okay why we can see federalism doesn't come you all know that india we have three tier government we have third tier but i can tell you only with respect to the structure of the government we have local governments as the third tier but with respect to the federal system of india local governments is not a third tier local government because federalism means you need federalism requires division of powers whereas uh, this division of power is done in the constitution constitution does the division of power in the seventh schedule for the state government and the central government only but it has ma not made the division of power anywhere the constitution has not made yeah 11th and 12th schedules are there they are just indicative in nature it's voluntary provision it is up to the state so as far as local government is concerned the powers is devolved so it is basically devolution of powers uh, for the local government so state government has to devolve their powers so there is sort of impermanence is already there right so the, the division of powers means a permanent division of power some supreme document will do it whereas devolution of power means it is subject to the government to decide so the state governments if they wish they can entrust more powers to their local governments and they can take back the powers for themselves also they don't want to share their powers also so it is all up to the state governments to decide so basically devolution is done not division is done state government devolves so federalism it's 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 wrong so india is a three tier government only with respect to the structure of the government with respect to the structure of indian federalism we are just two tier federalism only so the first option is wrong it's far away to become uh, local governments becoming federal system in india states won't allow it you all know that 65th and 64th 65th constitutional amendment bills were not passed in rajya sabha states had very serious objections in making them as a true third tier yeah they don't want their powers to be taken up and interested to some other new bodies they are not interested in that that's a distant dream they they are not part of federalism and the next one is uh, will why this administrative delegation doesn't come administrative delegation means it is executive delegating its powers it's not like that basically how the local governments gets their power devolved from who from the state government devolves their powers to the local governments state legislature through an act that's what the constitution part 9 and part 9a repeatedly uses the line the state legislature through an act state legislature through an act so it is the legislature which enters what are all the functions to them so basically it's not through any kind of administrative delegation whatever power they enjoy they are all delegated by the state legislature through an act <coughs> they are devolved through uh, state legislature through an act not through delegation from the executive and then uh, whether it has fulfilled the goals of direct democracy no direct democracy means we know that local governments empowers the local people village people local area people but it doesn't give them the power of direct democracy people doesn't do the things directly in fact even if you see the gram sabha the basic electorate uh, their power is very limited there is no basically direct democracy for even the most of the gram sabhas there is no substantive powers at all and what are the powers to the gram sabha once again state legislature through law has to give it to them so gram sabhas most of the states like gram sabhas doesn't have real powers and direct democracy means you know that people themselves the village people themselves basically gram sabha has to be the ruling body no here gram sabha is just only an electing body it's an electorate and little bit of other functions they do so it is the, the people and even preamble the word democracy is there it, though the only the word democracy is mentioned in preamble it doesn't indicate direct democracy it indicates only the representative democracy so direct democracy doesn't come up india's representative democracy so we can neglect 
negate these three options so democratic decentralization is the right option okay so we'll go for the next question consider the following statements in india a metropolitan planning committee is constituted under the provisions of the constitution of india is it true yes we have uh, article 243 is it e because 243 is a d is district planning committee and the next article 243 is a t goes for the metropolitan planning committee so it has been created by the provisions of the constitution that's true prepares the draft development plan for the metropolitan area that is the fundamental function of the metropolitan planning committee that's the core that's the primary function for them this is exactly the reason why the metropolitan planning committee has been created has the sole responsibility for implementing government sponsored schemes in the metropolitan area whether it is true or not look at this one first of all the word you should have been alert here is the word soul it's the only body oh that's wrong how can you say that there is only one body that is implementing the development programs in a district yeah even that that one word even if you do not even if you're not sure about whether this is a function of the metropolitan planning committee or not but still this one word will be, will make you alert and you will be skipping this answer you will be negating this answer and uh, look at this one but if you know the theory if you have already read the provisions you will come to see that government sponsored schemes or the implementation it's it doesn't have any responsibility for implementing at all they are planning committees look at the word the word will help you that's a good leading the word gives you a lot of information metropolitan planning committee so it's a committee it's a group of persons one thing and they make plan they make plan for the metropolitan area that's the simple straightforward they are just planning body and if you look into the functions of the metropolitan planning committee or district planning committee even you will come to recognize that these bodies basically they are plan making body and while making plan they do the consultations or uh, they can uh, they make a coordinated approach for panchayats and municipalities in the metropolitan area so it consults and then it recommends it makes a plan it recommends so these are all the basic functions it doesn't do any kind of executive function the district planning committee or metropolitan planning committee doesn't do any implementative or any executive any administrative functions they are just making plan making body they just make plans that's what their basic function is so they doesn't have any executive functions the executive functions is already is interested to the panchayats and the municipalities panchayats will do the executive functions municipalities will do the executive functions the district panchayat is there intermediate panchayat is there local panchayat is there municipal corporation municipal council town panchayats are there they they do the implementation of various schemes and programs but never the metropolitan planning committee or district planning it is just make plan so which means answer so this one is wrong even uh, even if you do not know whether they does the executive function or not i told that this word is enough for you to negate this answer so answer is one and two only so both is done yeah and uh, metropolitan planning committee basically they prepare a plan what plan a development plan and they forward this development plan to the state government when they prepare the plan they give reward regard to at least seven different matters they take into consideration they pay attention to so for instance uh, you must be remembering right so you have to go through the material so i can tell you one or two basic same for instance uh, basically what does it do it collects plan from all the panchayats and municipalities in the metropolitan area it collects them go through them and then based on those plans they will prepare whole metropolitan area development plan they'll prepare so they give regard to the plans which is already prepared by panchayats and municipalities in the metropolitan area number two uh, what investments is going to come up in that metropolitan area in the near future so they'll give regard to that and what are the uh, development plans already the state government and central government has got in mind for that metropolitan area they'll give importance to that and uh, so these are all the basic there are seven different matters they give consideration to so we don't want to get into detail of those seven matters 
but anyway so if you look at them they'll go through all of them they give regard to all the seven matters and based on those seven matters they prepare one plan for the whole metropolitan area development and then they forward it to the state government that's what it happened right anyway and even their recommendation do not even bind the government the executive doesn't want to uh, be abided state executive in no way it, it it binds them it's just a planning body it's just a recommend so whether it is a consultative body if they say yes whether it is a planning body yes whether it is a recommendatory body yes yeah these things we can say but with no real executive powers it's not an executive body at all yeah to the cost number so next we'll go for cost number 6 in the areas covered under the panchayat extension to the scheduled areas act what is the role power of gram sabha gram sabha has the power to prevent alienation of land in the scheduled areas is it true that's true gram sabha has the ownership of minor forest produce gram sabha has got yes recommendations of gram sabha is required for granting prospecting license or mining lease for any mineral in the scheduled area now this third option is a little bit it requires uh, that's where little complexity is there so whether gram sabha recommendation is required if you ask it means uh, yes but still this option is wrong because you know that it's either the gram sabha recommendation could be asked or even panchayat's recommendation is enough there is no need for gram sabha alone is giving uh, so you know that if you see the pesac basically pesac uh if you look into the provisions of the pesac you will come to recognize that there are some powers broadly three categories we can split into there are some powers where both gram sabha and panchayats are jointly given the powers that means what gram sabha also has the power panchayat also has the power both has the power so likewise there are some powers at least seven different powers has been listed for say for instance these two powers and all both gram sabha and panchayats powers gram sabha has in what are all those seven matters that's for you to read gram sabha has the power to prevent alienation of land in the scheduled area that's true that's one of the power gram sabha has the ownership of minus for minor forest produce that's also true and uh, areas covered in the areas covered under the panchayat extension to the scheduled areas act pesa act what is the role power of a gram sabha the role or power of a gram sabha so gram sabha has the power to prevent alienation of land in the scheduled area is it true yes that's the that's in fact we can say that's the core idea why gram sabha itself has been created under the scheduled areas i mean under the why the pesa act has been passed just to enable the gram sabha to do it that's one of the core function gram sabha has the ownership of minor for produce that's all true so in fact these two statements are factual statement straight from the functions or powers of gram sabha it comes into recommendation of gram sabha is required for granting prospecting license or mining lease for any mineral in the scheduled area if you look into the statement there is a little bit complexity there first instance when you read it it may look as a right option and it's very naturally students will choose also and uh, to trap you there is option 1 2 and 3 is there 1 and 2 only is also there so but still this option is wrong in a way it is right but in a way it is a, it's wrong also because recommendation of gram sabha is required whether it is required look at this one. either gram sabha or panchayat can make recommendation it's not that gram sabha alone has to require so even that means what even without the recommendation of gram sabha still it could be done and even it is not recommendation they are just consulted panchayats or gram sabha is consulted for this one otherwise uh, um, so and their recommendation is binding also yeah it's not just consulted consultation come with respect to rehabilitation or resettlement yeah or uh, acquisition of land in a scheduled area is done either gram sabha or panchayat the government goes and makes a consultation but before they grant prospecting license or mining lease for any mineral in the scheduled area definitely their recommendation is binding so what do they say but recommendation of gram sabha or panchayat that is how it is written so it's not the sole power of gram sabha 
so if you look into so basically if you see the pesa act you will come to recognize basically there are three different categories number one there are certain powers which is exercised by gram sabha and panchayat together so they both of them have the powers there are at least seven different powers and out of that seven powers only these two powers are there and what are the other powers for example both gram sabha and panchayat has the power to ban uh, consumption of alcohols or intoxicants uh, sale or even consumption so these things and all they can prevent and the minor forest produce they have the power prevent alienation of land in the scheduled area prevent money land money lending control money lending in the area so like we seven different functions both gram sabha and panchayat do if you look closely pesa act next to set either panchayat or gram sabha so either this this is both panchayat and gram sabha this is either panchayat or gram sabha has some power so there are three basic powers this power is one such power and then uh, <clears throat> third one is only to the panchayats for example to manage uh, minor water bodies in a in an area that's exclusively given to the panchayats not to the gram sabha so basically if you see the pesa act uh, the powers and functions of gram sabha and panchayat if you look into you will recognize them into three broad categories powers and functions the responsibilities that are given to gram sabha and panchayat together power that is given to either panchayat <coughs> or gram sabha either of them can exercise three powers and then just one power which is just given to the panchayats that i told you know to manage water body so it's factual area you need to memorize them so these two are both gram sabha has got the power panchayat has the power so gram sabha having the power is right but gram sabha having this one is not needed even with the panchayat's recommendation it could be carried out yeah gram sabha's recommendation is not at all needed also so that's why the option is 1 and 2 only okay so we'll go for the next question <clears throat> the government enacted and uh, can we see a rational for this question why this question pass act has come i can tell you one thing in 2010 the act was passed in 1996 uh, itself the act was passed uh, almost 13 14 years later and this act mandated that all the states which is having scheduled area in them we have uh, right now we have uh, uh, 10 states having a uh, pesa act and those days it was just nine states uh, 2014 only telangana was created so previously it was andhra now it is andhra and telangana so totally 10 states are there right now which is having the scheduled areas in them and if you look at those 10 states uh, at that time actually it was in 2010 ministry of i, I still remember it was national commission for scheduled tribes uh, the chairman or uh, this commission commission or the chairman of this commission they sent a a letter to the uh, ministry of panchayat raj telling them that most of the states have not made rules under the pesa act because you know, they reminded so ministry of panchayat raj then immediately it sent uh, um what um uh, asking the states okay those 10 states make rules so they reminded the states to make their rules look at it pesa act was passed in 1996 to 2010 when the ministry of panchayat raj sent notices to the states to frame rules under the pesa act they said that none of the states at that time there were nine states none of the nine state has made complete rules under the pesa act related to mining related to markets or related to um minerals related to uh, this alcohol related to excise related to forest management lot of minor forest produce lot of matters state governments has to make rules to implement to give effect to the pesa act all the states have already amended their respective panchayat acts to give effect to the pesa act but whether they have made di distinct rules related to various excise or forest uh, so these matters and all most of the states now uh, that's what none of the state has made complete rules under the pesa act in 2010 what's the status today look at in 96 it was passed and this 2021 marks the silver jubilee year, 25th year and it even till data Uh, just four states four states have not made most of the rules uh, uh, still they blame other uh, states like chatisgarh jharkhand madhya pradesh and odisha these four states have not made most of the rules under the pesa act they are still blamed so it's not just phenomenon of 2010 even it is the phenomenon of 2022 also 23 also so the answer is this one so next question 
So let's go for this question. The government enacted the Panchayat Extension to the Scheduled Areas Act, PESA Act, in 1996. We saw the previous question. It was in 2012. The next question came in 2013. Consecutively, two years PESA Act. Which of the following is not identified as its objectives? What is not the goal of PESA Act? So which is not a goal? So to provide self-governance, that's a goal. We can keep it. We can reserve the option. We have to look for the best possible wrong answer. To recognize the traditional rights of the tribal people, that's absolutely right. Yeah, their rights over their forest, their traditional rights over the land, their traditional rights over the forest, minor forest producer. So they have a lot of such um, prevent money laundering it's and all prevent money lending it's and all helping them to to safeguard their traditional rights to create autonomous regions in the tribal areas now this is absolutely wrong it doesn't create any autonomy to the region so that's that's wrong because what is creating autonomy for the tribal areas autonomy is given is created by six schedule right six schedule of the indian constitution gives provisions for creation of the tribal areas that means we will be creating district councils or uh, district councils, the governor of a state will be creating in those four states. So they will, he will be creating district councils or within them he will be creating regional councils. The district councils and regional councils function as autonomous units of self-government. To an ex That's the goal. Why six schedule was created, tribal areas created is to give self-administration autonomy for the <clears throat> tribal people, but not for the PES Act, to free the tribal people from the exploitation. Yeah, that is also true. Yeah, money lending is prevented, transfer of land, of tribal land to the non-tribes is prevented. All the thing is done. No? It is preventing tribal people from exploitation. This is true, this is true, this is true. So this doesn't come up absolutely. So this the, the idea is about scheduled area. That's fifth scheduled areas it is not the six schedule area. Six schedule area our intention is to create autonomy, self-government for the tribal people of the six schedule areas. But in the scheduled areas, there is no autonomy. It helps them in a particular way. So what are all the fun, what, oh, what are all the benefits that PESA Act offers to the panchayats and the uh, Gram Sabha? So that we have seen it in the previous question. No? So it is only for that purpose. It's not for any kind of self-government. Uh, sorry, it is not for any kind of autonomous self-government. Okay. And then uh, we'll go for the next question. If a particular area is brought under the fifth schedule of the Constitution of India, which of the following statements best reflects the consequence of it? Reflects the, best reflects the consequences of it. So this would prevent the transfer of land of tribal people to the non-tribal people. If it is in fifth schedule, if that is true, that is true. We all know that under the fifth schedule, the rules could be made, regulations could be made preventing transfer of tribal people to the non-tribal people. So governor could make regulations for it. That's one thing we know that. And this would create a local self-governing body in that area. Fifth schedule. It doesn't create any institutional setup for that. Uh, yeah, there is one body. We have tribes advisory council will be created in the states where there is fifth schedule areas are there. <clears throat> but the tribes advisory council, as the name indicates, they are just advisory body. They advise the state executive. They advise the governor. But that doesn't do any kind of other functions. So there is, so it's an advisory body will be there. Other than that, governing body, nothing is created under a fifth schedule area. No governing body is created. But under the fifth schedule area, the governing body, panchayats and panchayats will be already there. Gram Sabha will be there, panchayats will be there. For them, some powers will be in, enlarged through PES Act. That's a different story. But other than that, fifth schedule of the constitution doesn't create any kind of governing body at all. Um, governing body at all. Okay. Uh, if a particular area is brought under the fifth schedule of the constitution of India, which one of the following statements best reflects the consequence of it? So which statement closely comes up? So this would prevent the transfer of land of tribal people to the non-tribal people. Will it happen? Will it be a consequence? <clears throat> if suppose uh, an area is brought under the fifth schedule of the constitution. Yes. We all know that 
the governor of the fifth schedule area states where the governors are there he can make rules uh, prohibition of uh, a transfer of tribal land to the non tribal people he could make regulations and all could be made and uh, this would create a local self governing body in that area does the fifth schedule create any local uh, uh, government body it doesn't make any kind of local government body the fifth schedule areas will still be under the administrative control of the state executive only central executive will give advices give directions to the state executive to exercise the executive power that they can do so state executive exercises executive functions and then the central executive give directions to the state executive other than that what else the body is there we have the panchayats and municipalities which the fifth schedule has not created and panchayats and municipalities will have the regular powers and functions except those special responsibilities which is extended to them to the pesa act and then there will be one body will be there we all know that tribes advisory council will be there for the fifth schedule area states but that's only an advisory body that's giving advice to the state executive that is giving advice to the governor that's giving advice to the uh state executive to um, um regarding the administration that likewise they'll give an advice but there is no self governing body as such nothing is created it doesn't create it but if suppose it is a six schedule area creating a local self governing body we saw in the previous question itself so if it is a six schedule area creating a local governing government body if it is six schedule means that's right but not for the fifth schedule there is no self government body some special treatment some benefits are given to the people not less this one but pesa act gives little bit of self governing uh, benefits for them but only pesa act has to extend it fifth schedule the question is related to the fifth schedule it doesn't create anything like that pesa act only tries to give self governing functions to the scheduled area of panchayats and gram sabhas this would convert that area into union territory absolutely that's wrong it doesn't make any kind of a union territory at all fifth schedule is nowhere connected it's absolutely a wrong answer no way connected so it's, it's this option is given just to make an option okay the state having such areas would be declared of special category state that's also wrong we all know that special category state has nothing to do with the fifth schedule in fact the special category states is not a constitutional idea the special category status to the st special status to the states is given in the constitution we all know that but special uh, article 370 part 21 is there temporary transitional special provisions part is there so article 370 to 371 j we have got so jammu kashmir nagaland arunachal pradesh manipur mizoram uh, karnataka gujarat maharashtra andhra telangana so 12 different states are given some special benefits but that, that is special status it has nothing to do with special category states special category state is something that is a uh, it was introduced in india in 1969 based on uh, fifth finance commission recommendations the fifth finance commission recommended some states to be given special treatment and the fifth finance commission is not the origin of this uh, the special category state idea it's based on gargil's formula so gargil's formula they he listed this commission listed and the gargil basically listed certain conditionalities uh like hill areas or scattered population or substantial tribal population is there the resource endowment uh, backwardness of the people so he listed certain criterias and based on those criterias only special category states are created and based on that from 1969 onwards initially we gave to nagaland jammu kashmir and assam and then slowly we started to extend to various states uh, and then the 14 finance commission is a very important uh, body related to the special category states they said that do away with the concept of special category states uh, for the states which is except northeastern states and uh, uh, the three hilly states okay only to them which means eight northeastern states including sikkim seven sisters and then uh, himachal pradesh and then uttarakhand um so only for uh, the and then three hilly states so uttarakhand is there himachal pradesh is there and one more hilly state yeah so only for the three hilly states and eight the northeastern states which is 11 states will have the um, if a particular area is brought under the fifth schedule of the constitution of india which of the following statements best reflect the consequences of it this would prevent the transfer of land of tribal people to the non tribal people 
which of the following statement best reflects the consequences? Best reflecting of consequences. This would prevent the transfer of land of tribal people to the non-tribal. That is true, actually, because we all know that the governor can make regulations transferring of the tribal land to the non-tribal people. Governor can make regulations. We must be knowing. So this is correct. Uh, so this reflects. But anyway, best reflects, which is so closer to we have to choose, right? So let's go through the other options also. This would create a local self-governing body in that area. Fifth schedule provision will create local governments in a local self-governing body in that area. That is wrong. It doesn't create. Look at it. If it is sixth schedule, the intention of sixth schedule is to create self-governing bodies in the tribal areas. We create district councils. Yeah. District councils will be created or within district council, different tribes are there. Regional councils will be created. So these councils, they will function as self-governing body. But the fifth schedule doesn't create autonomy or self-government and all those things. But fifth schedule areas, self-governing body will be extended through PESAT. PESAT creates kind of self-governing powers to them. But fifth particular area is brought under the fifth schedule of the Constitution of India. Which of the following statements best reflects the consequences of it? This would prevent the transfer of land of tribal people to the non-tribal people. Is it true? This question came in 2022. So, fifth schedule areas consequences. <clears throat> Whether under the fifth schedule area, the prevention of transfer of tribal land, tribal land to the non-tribal people is happening. You know that the governor has the power to make regulations preventing the transfer of tribal land to the non-tribal people. He has got the power. That could be done, but governor has to make the rules. He can or he may not. So this option can come. This is not a compulsory option, but still this is one of the best options that comes closer to. Anyway, we'll keep it in reserve. Let's go through the remaining options. This would create local self-governing body in that area. Do the fifth schedule creates local self-governing body. It doesn't create. If suppose it is a sixth schedule, it is creating a local self-governing body. The option is fifth schedule. That's right. Because we all know that sixth schedule uh, creates tribal areas in four northeastern states of India, Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura, and Mizoram. In those states, the governors will create district councils or uh, regional councils within district councils. So these councils, if they are created, they act as a self-governing body. Or, but whereas in the scheduled area, who is the uh, governing body? The same. Uh, so it's not a self-governing body, basically. We have panchayats and panchayats will be there under the scheduled area. But they will be given some sort of self-governing powers, as we saw in the previous question. Some sort of self-governing powers would be given to them. But that's extended through PES Act, not through the fifth schedule area. So that there should be a link. A PESA Act, an Act of Parliament has to be there in order to give some sort of self-governing powers to the fifth schedule areas. Unless there is no PESA Act, fifth schedule doesn't give it directly. So that option is also doesn't come. We can skip that option anyway. Uh, you all know that uh, the fifth schedule doesn't create any kind of self-governing bodies there. It's normal panchayats. Every day, every place, regular panchayats will be there. PESA Act extended, that's all. But if there is no PESA Act, there is no self-governing aspect also. So fifth schedule as such doesn't give that option. So we can neglect that also, negate that one. This would convert that area into union territory. Absolutely wrong. Union territories are not created under the fifth schedule of the Indian constitution. That's just an option. Okay, to fill the gap, this option is written. That's how we can consider absolutely wrong. Basically, once a, a normal student, normally read student itself can negate that option. That's the worst option. The state having such areas would be declared of special category state. Now, that is also wrong, absolutely wrong, because uh, the constitution gives provisions related to special status to the states is given. Some special treatment is given to the states. Um, special provisions are given to the states. You all know that part 21 of the constitution, having articles from 370 to 371J, at least for 12 different states, Jammu, Kashmir, um, Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Nagaland, uh, uh, 
Arunachal Pradesh, Mizoram, Manipur. So likewise for uh, 12 different states, some special treatment is given under the part 21 of the constitution. But special category states is just an executive phenomena. That's uh, union government's formula it is basically. You all know that in 1969, the special category status was for, was recommended based on Fifth Finance Commission's recommendation. The Fifth Finance Commission is not the originator of the idea of special category states, which was based on Gargill formula. So based on what we call it as Gargill formula, um, so he has given some five different criteria based on those five criteria a state could be declared as a special category state and then you can give them some, some benefits. With respect to the centrally sponsored schemes, there is some concession that is given to them. And uh, so, uh, so that's what it was created. It, it is, it's, it's in admins. Even you all know that 14 Finance Commission has even recommended to go away with the concept of special category states for uh, uh, various states. They said that continue it for the eight northeastern states and the three hilly states, but don't continue it for other states. Right now, Odisha is demanding. Uh, Andhra Pradesh is demanding, Telangana is demanding, but it is a big blow to them because 14 Finance Commission has said that don't give to anybody else. But instead, uh, uh, center's share of taxes, uh, central taxes a share to the states, so they increase it to 42%. That is what they said. But don't give the special category states to any more except those uh, eight northeastern states and three hilly states. And uh, eight northeastern states, we... Sikkim and the Seven Sisters and three uh, hilly states means Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand and Jammu and Kashmir. Now Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh is a union territory and uh, which means uh, union government's responsibility is now and then uh, so which means it has become two today, right? So right now we have 10 states in India having the special category states and three more states at least minimum are demanding Odisha. Andhra Pradesh and Telangana are demanding, but they won't give. They are not ready to give anyway. So this is an executive union executive's business, not the... And Finance Commission plays a much important role in this phenomena, but it's not constitutional creation. So fifth schedule doesn't create. So the answer is A. That's why 2022, this is the question. And, um, and you all know that 2022, the issue was in news continuously. Uh, because Andhra is very seriously demanding special category states for them. That was coming up very frequently. And fifth schedule is already in news throughout the year. Yeah, mining that, this, uh, always it comes up, right? Fifth schedule comes up. Which of the following provisions of the Constitution of India have a bearing on education? <clears throat> Direct to principles of state policy. Is it yes? Yes. We know that Article 41 is there, Article 45 is there, and then Article 46, we'll come to those articles. They are all related to education. 45 is directly connected, but 41, 46, we'll come to that. And then rural and urban local bodies. Yeah, panchayats and municipalities. Yeah, if you go through 11th schedule and 12th schedule, you'll find education is one one subject. That's for uh, panchayats and municipalities, it has been kept. So that also comes up. Fifth schedule, no direct mentioning of education anyway. So sixth schedule, yeah, sixth schedule, the district councils and the regional councils are given power to establish, uh, to administer, to establish, to construct and maintain uh, schools, primary schools and all they can construct. That is how it is written, tribal areas, the district council has the power to establish and run uh, the school. So this is true. Seven schedule, yeah, seven schedule. You all know that 42nd amendment. Uh, now it is under news also presently. Uh, so the question came in 2012. We'll come to that later. So 42nd amendment, you all must be knowing it shifted five subjects, no, from the state list to the concurrent list. So the um, uh, forest management, uh, weights and measures, uh, so, likewise, uh, in education. So, five subjects from the state list, 42nd Amendment took it and it, it, it made us a concurrent list provision. So, seven schedule education is mentioned, yes. Okay, 42nd Amendment has brought it. So, one, two, four, and five. Select the correct answer using the code below. One and two only, that's wrong. Yeah. Because seven schedule makes a provision, how can you say no? Yeah, five is there and all the three, three, four, and five, which means they are skipping one. That's absolutely wrong. Directive principle, we have uh, 
various articles no for instance uh, article 45 uh, presently it says no uh, uh, what does it say uh, taking early childhood care and education to the children below the age of 6 years it speaks about that directive is there that's number 1 and then if you see uh, one article um, so right to education right to work and special assistance for some people right old age sickness undeserved want and all those things that's article 41 is speaking like that and if you see article 46 uh, promoting the educational and economic interests of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes that word is that is there so scheduled caste scs and sts educational and economic interests is 46 so education is dealt repeatedly at least three different areas the education comes up in directive principles of state policy part 4 of the constitution that's true and all the rest of the things i've explained so 1 2 and 5 only so which means they are skipping 3 and 4 no that's wrong so because six schedule areas district councils are given the power already i've told so 1 2 3 4 and 5 okay now look at this one 3 we i i said there is no direct provision with respect to 3 but uh, optionally this is the best option we can choose select the correct answer using the code below so we can choose 1 2 3 4 and 5 okay remotely you can connect uh, indirectly you can connect fifth schedule with education because fifth schedule directly doesn't make any provisions related to education but i can tell you um, fifth schedule has the provision related to um, the tribes advisory council will make recommendations will give advices for the welfare and advancement of tribal people in the area so they make recommendations on the welfare of the tribal people advancement of the tribal people means very naturally they make uh, uh, educational welfare related to that they will be making recommendations and central executive will be sending directions to the state executive for the welfare and advancement of the tribal people which means obviously to improve the educational welfare of the tribal people of that area central government is expected to give the directions and all so in that sense like you can definitely Uh, the tribal people living in the scheduled areas their educational interest will be dealt but if you look into the fifth schedule the word education is nowhere is used the word is nowhere is coming up but as i said indirectly you can make a connection and you can say that fifth schedule gives takes care of the educational aspects of the tribal people also likewise we can consider so we can choose 1 2 3 4 and 5 so the rest is wrong okay which and one more thing why this question has come 2012 there is a rational clear rational for it why education became a news uh, you all know that right to education act was passed in 2009 but it came into force from april uh, 1 2010 onwards it came into force so it came into force in 2010 uh, a constitutional validity right to education acts constitutional validity was challenged in the supreme court and in 2012 i think it was in april or somewhere 2 3 months just closer to previous to this prelims 2012 prelims 3 4 months within that i mean i can tell you for starting from jan to uh, may period of 2012 so where in this period supreme court upheld the constitutional validity of right to education act this is valid so constitutional constitution is making provisions for education and rt act is trying to implement it so it's a constitutional mandate that rt act is fulfilling supreme court held that it is absolutely valid the last constitutional yeah it's a constitutional mandate uh, to fulfill education so it was in news basically so that's the rational why this question has come not coming through any vacuum anyway so 10th question which of the following schedules of the constitution of india contains provisions regarding anti defection anti defection regularly in news and this is a straight forward questions from the schedules all the 12 schedules each schedule what does it deals with that's the basic thing every student is expected to know and i i can tell you broadly uh, all the parts of the constitution if a part to one what's its title okay so it goes from what article to what article article 1 to 4 it goes and then it deals about union and its territories so and then part 2 starts from 5 to 11 uh it deals about citizenships likewise you have to go for all the 22 parts 25 parts in total it ends with roman letter 22 so all the parts their article ranges and what does it deals with 
that's a something that's an area that you should all memorize because questions if you know the skeleton of this constitution the structure of the constitution with the articles and the titles of the parts means broadly you can understand which article deals about which phenomena so likewise you, and you are tested and then 12 schedules also each one of the schedule 1 2 3 up to 12 schedule each schedule deals with what what matter that is also you must be knowing questions comes from this structure of the constitution even it's a memory area it's a factual area but i can tell you with respect to part 5 and part 6 of the constitution part 5 and part 6 which is related to union government this is related to the state government i even suggest you go for chapter wise also <clears throat> for instance if union government um, article number 52 251 uh, if you see it means there are subdivisions are there union executive that means president prime minister council of ministers attorney general vice president club them all together what's the article number dealing about them <clears throat> what's the article the deals about uh, parliament what's the article the deals about supreme court what's the article the deals about uh, cag so likewise in each chapter wise so these two parts are not only the part and the title and the article ranges of these two parts but even i am suggesting you go to the chapters also but if you are familiar with that means some of the questions in the past in the upsc has come with this straight forward factual answers but anyway so which of the following schedules of the constitution contains provisions related to anti defection so 52nd amendment act brought this anti defection law we all know that so which schedule of the constitution it has introduced 10 schedule of the constitution right you all know that but there is one more strange thing also look at it if you go through all the schedules of the constitution uh, this is the schedule you all know that original constitution had eight schedules in total so ninth schedule was inserted by first constitutional amendment act so ninth to 12th schedules all added through various amendments through various uh, period so original constitution had only eight schedules so which means 10th uh, schedule anti defection is also newly introduced phenomena into the constitution 10th schedule also added into the constitution through an amendment so applying those logics also you can say or it is a straight forward question just a memory of what schedule deals with what phenomena that's <clears throat> based on that you can answer this question okay the provisions in the fifth schedule and sixth schedule of the constitution of india are made in order to this is straight forward question the purpose of fifth schedule and sixth schedule you all know that fifth schedule creates scheduled area sixth schedule creates tribal area okay to protect the interests of the scheduled tribes that is absolutely true to determine the boundaries between the states yeah that's the states reorganization commission do it that's done by the parliament yeah through an act state reorganization act so parliament has the power or which is i can say which is part one of the indian constitution deals with this phenomena determine the powers authority and responsibilities of panchayats no that's wrong it is part 9 of the constitution and uh, the powers and functions will be determined to them through state legislature or we can say uh, 11th schedule of the constitution is del- dealing with it so these things are connected with that panchayats and then protect the interests of all the border states no no are those border states and all those things is mentioned in the constitution constitution doesn't make mentioning of any border states in that regarding foreign policy even uh regarding border is no straight forward provisions from the constitution indirectly very remotely you can connect a constitution provision with the border state there's no even that is very difficult there is no direct provision in the constitution to deal with that so this option is wrong this doesn't come this doesn't come which means protecting the interests of the scheduled tribes let's go for the next question consider the following statements if a parliament the parliament of india can place a particular law in the ninth schedule of the constitution of india okay which of the statements are correct okay whether the parliament can keep it that's true that's right that's straight forward statement the validity of a law placed in the ninth schedule of the constitution cannot be examined by any court and no other ju- no judgment can be made on it okay and the statement is correct i can tell you if the statement is up to here then we may have a dilemma a doubt because it is partly true partly wrong also because if you read the article 31b yeah it runs like this yeah the 
whatever law that is kept inside the in fact why 31b itself was inserted just to say that any law that is kept inside the ninth schedule they cannot be examined by the judiciary for the violation of fundamental rights any of the fundamental rights that's the purpose it has been added uh, so if it is up to here we can say that we can have but supreme court has held that no in the ir kohello case the supreme court held that and also in the vaman rao case two cases are very closely related to that in both the cases supreme court has said that it is subject to the judicial review we will check for the constitutionality we will check for the validity supreme court has said so going for the supreme court judgment we can say that judiciary court can examine the validity as per god's judgment but if you read 31b and 9 schedule 31b if you read it means you will say the statement is correct supreme court judgment you interpret based on supreme court judgment means you will say it as wrong so which one to choose yes sir no so this is a dilemma but but look at the next which very clearly says no judgment can be made on it this line has been added upsc tries to put the statement very clear judiciary cannot make any judgment on it means this statement absolutely is wrong no judgments are made already so many judgments has been made that's why so this statement is wrong okay which of the above statement given above is are correct so answer is one only yeah so answer is one only mm. okay we all know that and why it came in 2018 there is a clear rational for it this was in repeated news throughout the year 2018 even i can tell you starting from 2016 17 18 these are all the years repeatedly nine schedule in news for instance first uh, Haryana did this uh, reservation uh, uh, for uh, uh, Rajasthan did it in 2017. Yeah, Gujar's reservation, Jats reservation was in news, and then Telangana did it in 2017. They increased their reservation uh, to uh, the Supreme Court has already said in this um, Mandal Commission case or Indra Savhani case. They said that the reservation shall not exceed 50%. but still tamil nadu is the first state to violate that and they gave the reservation to 69% and then rest of the states later in 2010 supreme court upheld that if there is scientific foundation for giving breaching the 50% mark means you can do it but you have to prove it in the court of law that there is a scientific justification for it that's what they have said so now some states have done it for instance uh, rajasthan has exceeded today gujarat has exceeded and um, no rajasthan has done it and haryana has done it and then telangana has done it these are all telangana hiked the reservation for muslims and scheduled tribes the reservation percentage they increased it in their states so these are all the states where the reservation has exceeded 50% mark and last year this year i mean uh, this 2022 november december jharkhand has raised uh, the reservation also and uh, stunningly they have went to reservation up to 77% of total reservation in public employment so it is in news this year also i'm saying but it was in news in this 2017 and 18 and the the, the, the cases were filed and these states when they passed this law they want to escape from the judicial review they ask the parliament parliament make an amendment add these laws into the ninth schedule so that our laws will not be declared as uh, invalid judiciary cannot review they expected but supreme court has the power to review all know that uh, the supreme court has said that uh, those acts which were kept after the 24th april 1973 that that is the date on which the uh, keshwananda bharati verdict was given so Uh, from that date onwards basic structure doctrine has come into force which means you insert any law the laws that you have inserted inside it previous of this date we will not look for the validity judicial uh, review we will not do it constitutional validity we won't do it through through those laws but those laws which has been added later uh, from the 24th april 1973 the judgment date onwards so we will check it either it violates article 14 15 19 21 or basic structure of the constitution if any of this five phenomena if a law is violating a regulation that is kept in say ninth schedule is violating we'll declare them as unconstitutional and invalid we have the right to review judiciary has made it categorically clear in the ir koello case versus state of tamil nadu case anyway so the answers one only so it was in news 2016 uh to 2018 throughout the year it was repeatedly in news okay 
and the next the nine schedule was introduced in the constitution of india during the prime ministership of okay this is the basic question you all know that the nine schedule has been original constitution had only eight schedule nine schedule was inserted to fulfill the purpose of article 31b so article 31b and nine schedule both were simultaneously introduced into the constitution by the very first amendment 1951 because uh, article 13 what does it say any law that violate fundamental right is invalid so this article 13 is used by various zamindars throughout india preventing various state governments from implementing land reforms abolition of zamindari system or doing agriculture reforms were all hindered by various state governments so that is why the government uh, the, the nehru government they felt that we original constitution that's a mistake that we have made so let's clarify that one so that's why they brought this first schedule uh, of the indian constitution ninth schedule and 31b were inserted by first constitutional amendment act of 1951 so which was done during first amendment means basically whose period it is obviously it is jawaharlal nehru's period only you, if if you simply know that ninth schedule is added through first amendment first amendment is passed in 1951 so even if it is 1951 you do not know the year it's in the beginning of the constitution coming into force and so actually prime minister nehru was there for a very long time right Uh, till that he stands as the longest serving prime minister of india so obviously all these reasons this straight forward question there is no specific rational i can tell you but i can tell you it was in news i told not through till 2018 starting from 2016 to 2018 the ninth schedule uh, because of this reservation laws uh, violating supreme court's judgment and all were all passed and all those things it was in news so next under which schedule of the constitution of india can the transfer of tribal land to the private parties for mining be declared null and void the first in came in 2019 why it came in 2019 there is a rational for it in 2019 when this exam was conducted this question came just 3 4 months back just immediately 3 4 months before this mains it is actually a supreme court judgment but even you don't want to know that and all Uh, but i can tell you the rational is current uh, current of it was in news that is why it became a question um so justice ramaswami he died justice k ramaswami his name is his former supreme court judge he was he is retired he is in andhra pradesh he died and uh, the state government conducted a funeral with the, the state respect and all those things because he was remembered for one landmark judgment that is samata judgment so samata uh, case it was against uh, mining um, so in state of karnataka or something this judgment uh, samata case we simply call this judgment was given in 1997 and uh, he said this one actually this is a judgment this is a landmark judgment this is the text of the judgment okay uh the transfer of tribal land to the private parties for mining can be declared null and void he said it in this judgment it was declared in the judgment it was declared the transfer of land was declared as null and void under the fifth schedule of the constitution that's why the tribal people remember him a lot since he belongs to andhra andhra government also andhra la there is substantial amount of tribal people is there so he is remembered as one important judge there so he gave this important judgment so it is fifth schedule of the constitution even if you do and this is only a rational for for the sake why this question has come it's not coming through vacuum there is a reason for this kind of a question is coming up but anyway so but if you even if you do not know that judgment you have not read the newspaper who is justice ram swami why did it that even if you do not know that but you know that third schedule of the constitution deals about forms of oath and affirmation of various ministers and all so it's 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 oath and affirmation related to the some constitutional officers so this doesn't come up and the ninth schedule ninth schedule deals about uh, the last that is giving exemptions to the fundamental rights and 12th schedule it deals about yeah municipalities sort of functional items there so this also doesn't come this also doesn't come fifth schedule is related to the tribal people yeah that's for tribal land is already the word tribe is there fifth schedule sixth schedule related to the tribes even with that option that you can choose this one right yeah with reference to the finance commission of india which of the following statements is correct it encourages the inflow of foreign capital for infrastructure development it facilitates the proper distribution of finances among the public sector undertakings 
it ensures the transparency in financial administration so whether it does any of that which of the following statement is correct if you look at it remotely all of them are two and indirectly it is correct very distant connections we can make and all seems to be right but look at the fourth option none of these statement are given above is correct so this fourth statement will help you to interpret this question so it is though indirectly somehow we can say that this is all there but still everyone is of the same standard you understand so nothing of them is clearly fits so none of these statements a b c given above is correct in this context so we can say that because uh, so what is basically the functions of the finance commission basically it does recommendation on the three phenomena plus one so what are all the three phenomena it makes recommendations into none of the three is mentioned here so what is that three um, number one the total what's the first step? it's basically a recommendatory body it makes recommendations on three items they make recommendations their report consists of basically three ideas number one the total net proceeds of taxes to the central government how it has to be distributed between the center and the states and among the states how it has to be allocated so this is one thing they will give an elaborate recommendation and number two they say that for instance 41% of the total central taxes share it with the states central government you keep only 59% that's the current formula the recent uh, report whereas uh, if you see it uh, um, so this is one recommendation number two the central government is giving grant and aid to the states from the consolidated fund of india so they don't give equal grant and aid to all the states so each different states will be given different different grant and aid depending on various criteria so what all the principles based on which you have to give grant and aid to the states from the consolidated fund so what principle should guide the central government Yeah, uh, my party is ruling in that state. I give them more grant. Not like that. This should not be a discretionary aspect, right? So it has to be some sort of some formula has to be going on. This is federal system, so states must be treated equally. But special states which is need needing special treatment has to be given more grants. So there are certain principles you have to devise, and this finance commission will do will do it. That is their second function. And what's the third function? They do it as a. Uh, the measures that could be taken to augment the consolidated fund of a state so that the resources for the panchayats and municipality in the states gets better resources they'll get it and this they'll do it based on the state finance commission all state finance commission reports they collect they go through it and then they based on that they'll make a recommendation these are the basically three recommendations finance commission does and none of them is connected here so we can negate all the three and fourth one is that president may interest any other Uh, functions to the finance commission based on uh, recommendatory functions to the finance commission based on that they'll make recommendations what the president has asked they'll give that also so none of them is connected here so in this context we can say since we cannot pick any one specifically all the three are indirectly correct all the three are directly wrong so in this context we apply means we can choose none of the above so that's the 15th one anyway so it was in 2011 i can tell you finance commission was in news 2010 2011 and all repeatedly it was in news because you know that uh, uh, the finance commission uh, i think it is 13th finance commission the duration uh, its recommendation started i mean that finance commission that year uh, the, the duration of finance commission recommendation covers for 5 years no so it's covered from 2010 to 2015 it was set up in 2007 or something the 13th finance commission if if i'm right it is 13th finance commission and it rec its recommendations covered up to 2000 uh, i mean 2009 december they submitted the report and then from 2010 to 2015 is the period the duration period so they made some substantial uh, very significant recommendations and so 2010 it was in discussion uh, states has to reduce the revenue deficit and uh, um, uh, what devolution of central share to the states uh, what how it has to be and then they even said that a fixed share must be allocated from the state governments to the panchayats so that's a very significant uh, recommendation made by that body so it was in news 
finance commission was making some revolutionary recommendations at that time it's not that revolutionary in that sense you don't want to look into but some significant notable recommendations were made and uh, the first budget was passed in uh, after this finance commission recommendation period the first budget speech the finance minister then he quoted the finance commission a number of times in his budget speech so various reasons throughout 2011 it was a news 2010 to 15 is their period so it was a news finance commission is already in making news Just in repeated news, it was. So, which of the following is are among the noticeable features of the recommendations of the Thirteenth Finance Commission? Okay, Thirteenth Finance Commission is making a recommendation, and among all the recommendations they have made, they are picking up and giving few options and choosing, asking you to choose the right recommendations. If you look at it, if knowing answer for this question, it's not going to help you in any way because it's not going to help you because. Uh, you cannot expect this question getting repeated at all it's old dead and buried 13th finance commission is over you cannot expect this question coming up again but this question gives you a very important signal that finance commission recommendations can become a question that you have to read in right it's proven here the current finance commission is 15th finance commission uh, its duration is yeah previous question is related to 13th finance commission so this 15th finance commission is currently going on its duration is 2021 to 20 a uh, six period it is their recommendation period covers this one so 15th finance commission recommendations is pure current affair it's not something static material you'll go through it's pakka current affair through current affair articles you will be reading it anyway so it has to be read that's the point anyway we'll see the answer noticeable features so most significant recommendation because if you're reading the whole recommendation of the finance commission it runs into hundreds of pages that is not needed noticeable salient features of the recommendations alone is enough a design for the goods and service tax okay and a compensation package linked to the adherence to the proposed design that's was right in fact this is one of the core very important uh, Uh, reason why 13th finance commission is remembered for i can tell you because uh, originally the plan was to roll out gst from 2010 onwards april 1 2010 onwards gst has to be introduced in india that was the original plan but you all know that 7 years later later in 2017 only real gst came out and it was not the congress which was doing it but bjp did it nda did it not upa too but it was the initial plan was 2010 to bring it up and uh, that goal was not achieved so this because states were opposing to it some states will make lot of losses and all those things if you introduce gst so that's why this finance commission when it was appointed on terms of reference was given what is that by the president made this point on uh, central finance commission that if we implement a gst so what kind of compensation what package we can do it and then uh, what kind of a gst plan we can design so all those things they have asked the recommendation to be given so they did it and the second one design for the creation of lakhs of jobs in the next 10 years in the concerns with the india's demography dividend it is just it's not at all there no such recommendation was given is just an imaginary line that is some artificially inserted into the options so it is absolutely wrong they didn't speak anything about it devolution of a specific specified share of central taxes to the local bodies as grants um that's true that's one of the significant recommendations they have made it central government's taxes low specified share that has to be uh, allocated for the local governments they said it and this is a direct recommendations from the uh, 13th finance commission um so but even if you do not know the thing but if you still go through the options means you can say that finance commission is basically a body as uh, that's helpful in sustaining the fiscal federalism in india it's a balancing wheel for fiscal federalism in india that's how finance commission is described so deals about center state financial relations related matters so this one is related to center state finances this one is related to the uh, center uh, and state devolution of states from the center means basically uh, giving to the states and then goes to the locals so this is also related to uh, federalism this is related to federalism this is nowhere related to the federalism so absolutely uh, this is just uh, this option doesn't fit into so in that sense also you can neg negate this option but if you have read it already finance commission recommendation which is you are expected to prepare and come you did it now that's okay yeah so the answer is 1 and 3 only okay in india 
other than ensuring that public funds are used efficiently and for intended purpose okay what is the importance of the office of the cag importance of the office of the cag the question has come up because in 2012 cag was again and again was in news we'll come to that later cag unusually cag was in news not usual news making events unusual news making of cag it happened during that period okay let's see the options and then we'll go for the key and then we'll go for the rational later cag exercises exchequer control on behalf of the parliament when the president of india declares national emergency or financial emergency so when national emergency is declared or financial emergency is proclaimed whether cag exercises exchequer control on behalf of the parliament on behalf of the parliament look at it, parliament's functions can never be delegated subordinate legislations will be there executive will be given some power to make rules under the laws that could be done but parliament has to do the functions that is interested to the parliament it's a parliament cannot delegate its functions parliamentary functions only parliament does it even parliamentary committees makes only recommendations so parliament so somebody doing functions on behalf of parliament that's something wrong but i can tell you one more thing also even if you not applying that logic i can tell you cag is just a report making body recommendatory body they submit a report or uh, what is the nature of cag it doesn't it's not an executive it's neither an executive nor a legislature cag is an office that makes the union executive or state executive accountable on financial matters to the legislature that means union executive financially accountable to the parliament this is ensured by the cag so cag is a tool that makes this phenomena happen that's all so cag is just a body or we can see it in this way cag is like an agent of the parliament like that also we can assume but let's not use that word it's it doesn't reflect it very clearly cag is a body uh, this this is very perfect cag is a body that's purpose that's the a, that's the main reason why cag is created is to make this union executive financially accountable to the parliament or accountable to the parliament on financial matters because ours is parliamentary form of government parliament is the supreme body people's body they have the people's representative so executive is taking care of the day to day financial administrations so executive there is a possibility that executive executive may misuse the revenues misuse the expenditures and all those things so in those matters and all they have to be con consciously watched audited a report has to be prepared and then they will intimate to the owners of the money who is the parliament of india so look we are the owner but the executive was managing the fund all this whole year what mischievous things they did it or whether they did it is right or wrong so everything has to be parliament has to be informed so this function is done by cag that's why cag office is very crucial for any parliamentary form of government or i can put it in this way if you are having a parliamentary form of government having an office of auditor general this office of like cag is mandatory without the office of cag you cannot have a parliamentary form of government like that you can understand that's a mandatory office so anyway so they act uh, on behalf of parliament that's wrong they doesn't act on behalf of parliament they doesn't have any legislative power they doesn't have any executive power it's just an accommodatory body they have little bit of quasi judicial powers they've got and cag reports on the execution of projects or programs by the ministries are discussed by the public accounts committee yeah, any student uh, have read this basic polity cag report and parliament you would have chosen this option as correct because uh, uh, public accounts committee the basic the cag is the friend philosopher and guide to the public accounts committee they examine cag reports in detail no they submit reports and all so the basic function of public accounts committee itself has to be carried out with the help of cag report and with the help of cag so this option is correct second is correct third information from cag reports can be used by investigative agencies to press charges against those who have violated the law while managing public so by using the cag reports can you um, uh, can the investigative agencies um, in their charge sheet no they file it in the court of law and all can they uh, can they say that we investigated because cag reports said that and all those things can they do it yes that is true that was current affair that was in news that year i can tell you it was in 2010 cag report 
the 2G spectrum chaos got unfolded, right? So 1,70,000 crore. So the telecom minister is making allocation of the 2G spectrum to the companies. When he was giving license to the company, licenses to the companies for 2G spectrum, he was going based on first, first come first serve basis instead of going for auction. If suppose you have done auction means uh, you would have gained uh, the Indian exchequer uh, would have got this much money. But since instead of not going first come first of not going based on auction, going for first come first of basis, exchequer has lost one lakh seventy thousand crores, seventy six thousand crores. And he made a number also. He quantified the loss for the Indian exchequer. So when this number, this created huge chaos in India, it unfolded a lot of political events in India. We all know that it happened in the report in 2010, 2011. Fully, it was in news, and the case was filed in the Supreme Court based on the CAG's uh, uh, report. A fraud has happened. 2012, Supreme Court was giving a judgment cancelling all the 122 licenses. So it was before this main Supreme Court has cancelled. And why this case originated went in Supreme Court all based on CAG order report. CAG order report was the basis based on which the case was filed. The investigation was done and all those things was done and court was coming to a conclusion and all those things. It was perfect news actually it was. While dealing with the audit and accounting of the government company, CAG has certain judicial powers for prosecuting those who violate the law. No, he doesn't have any power to prosecute at all. He can do the auditing. He can. Uh, he has little bit of quasi-judicial powers. But uh, can he do the prosecution and all? He doesn't have the power of a law enforcement agency. He doesn't prosecute them and all. He just mentions them in the report. And this report uh, he submitted to the union executive that is president. President will table it before the parliament and let the parliament do it. That's all. Parliament can cause something to be done and all those things could be done. Public accounts committee will recommend the parliament that what could be done, what could not be done, that kind of recommendation, something could be done. But no prosecutions can be. Executive can do it, but not, can order doing it. But CAG has no power of prosecution, recommendations, nothing like that. Hey, recommendations you can do it, no prosecutions. So which means two and three only. Four is wrong. One is also wrong, absolutely wrong. So which means answer is three and four. Okay. With reference to the delimitation commission, consider the following statements. The orders of the delimitation commission cannot be challenged in the court of law. Okay, question came in 2012. I can tell you there is no specific rational. I, can, I, I cannot, I can, because if it is 2002, we can say, yeah, delimitation commission act was passed, delimitation commission, fourth delimitation commission in India was set up. But after that, there is no more fifth delimitation commission has been set up. Now only for Jammu Kashmir, a temporary commission has been set up. A, a current, right now, a commission has been set up. That's going on in news. For this 2023, uh, it's going in the news. But 2012, Delimitation Commission was not in news. It's not making any significant news, but still it came. Okay. So the orders of the Delimitation Commission cannot be challenged in the court of law. Is it true? That's absolutely true. Because it's a it's a body that says the uh, it's 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 it, its laws cannot be challenged in the court of law. Delimitation Commission, it's it's a quasi-judicial body, it gives a verdict that's final. The function, the delimitation itself, it's a kind of quasi judicial function only. When the orders, and it is a statutory but right? When the orders of the delimitation commission are laid before the Lok Sabha Legislative Assembly, they cannot affect any modifications in the order. That is also true. The delimitation commission recommendations have the force of law. And uh, it's like a quasi judicial function, it is. And their recommendations will be tabled, but will not be modified. Their orders are final. Okay. Or uh, I can tell you uh, the orders are final. This one line, you can interpret in this way, you can interpret in this way, but this is a deliberate line. It's the straightforward provision. When you, as a basic student who has read Delimitation Commission, will know that these two lines are straight away picked from the Delimitation Commissions. Okay, so which means both are right. So which of the following statement is correct? Both one and two. So what does delimitation commission basically? As I said, there is no specific rational. We cannot say any fine specific rational. 2012, what is the reason to ask delimitation commission? We cannot find any such reason, but still it came. So this this is that's possible. That's what I said. There is no need for a reason. 
it's right away it's in syllabus connected to syllabus just read it that's all okay so constitution is a delimitation commission uh, is created through constitutional mandate yeah constitution makes this provision no article 70 uh, 6 and article 180 uh, yeah it makes a provisions related to the uh, parliament after each census has to pass an act uh, and create delimitation commission to carry out two functions right uh, basically a delimitation commission performs three functions to be precise uh, one uh, they'll draw the territorial boundaries of the states uh, territorial boundaries of the territorial constituencies both for state legislative assemblies as well as to the Lok Sabha, and that's number one. Number two, the uh, number of seats allotted to each state also, they make recommendation. But fourth, delimitation commission didn't do it, 2002, because 42nd Amendment has said that that has to be done after 2021. Uh, 2001, after, so you all know that history, right? It's, it's an elaborate complex things that goes on. But anyway, but I can tell you delimitation commission is a news presently. It is very important because, uh, I mean, not, not in news, uh, but still delimitation commission is very, very crucial. Election is very crucial because 2026 is the year. Uh, so which means 2024 is the last general election to be conducted based on the fourth delimitation commission. After 2026, any election is to be conducted either for the parliament or for any of the state legislative assemblies throughout India. You have to do it post-2026 means you have to do it only after the delimitation commission is making recommendation based on the recently available census. So which means uh, it's going to make a news after 2024. That's the last general election under the fourth delimitation commission recommendation. The next election could not be conducted unless fifth delimitation comes commission comes up so which means we are very closer uh, so that will be news anyway the limitation commission elections and all we have to prepare anyway so next is which of the following bodies do not find a mention in the constitution a straightforward question national development council planning commission zonal councils okay none of them is mentioned you all know that zonal council is a statutory body created through states reorganization act uh, 1956. In fact, uh, this com zonal council itself has been created. The zonal council itself has been created because uh, uh, when the new states were created based on language, so a, a, a body that could enable them to come together uh, so that regional states can come together, sit and deliberate. So this mechanism could be created. So to bring synergy between the states, to establish coordination between the states and to enable a platform for the states to come together and discuss the matters of common interest, zonal councils were created and states reorganization act based on that it is created. But for Northeastern states, Northeastern Zonal Council Act, a separate act is passed in 1971 and a separate zonal council is created for us. So we have six zonal councils. It's a pure statutory body. It's not constitution that is creating. And then interstate council, if they ask, it is constitutional body. Constitution makes provision only to that. Zonal council is a statutory body. Whereas planning commission and national development council, they are both, they are neither statutory nor constitutional bodies. They were created through executive resolution. Yeah. The cabinet, they sat. PM and the cabinet ministers, they passed the resolution and then they created the planning commission and national development council. So all the three are non-constitutional bodies, which means one, two, and three. Yeah. Who among the following constitute the national development council, the composition of the national development council? 2013 once again. Previous question also 2013. So National Development Council 2013, two questions are coming up related to National Development Council and Planning Commission. So they both are interconnected bodies. You all must be knowing. A basic student knows it. So why it was in news, I can tell you uh, 2012, the five-year plan started. 2012 to 2017 is the, the five-year plan. And that's the last five-year plan. And after that, 2014 planning commission was abolished. So since 2012, 13 and all, there was a discussion. What is the relevance of planning commission anymore? So is it relevant anymore? Will it be continued? So when this NDA came to power in 2014, 
they passed a resolution just to abolish planning commission but they have not abolished the national development council yet it's still their namesake it is there but it is not met after this 2000 Uh, 13 and all they have not met at all so anyway so 2013 uh, 2012 the five year plan started in india so 2013 i can tell you before this prelims 2012 december ndc meet went um, they meet twice in a year generally that is expected ndc is expected to meet twice in a year but uh, not twice in a year they have met so it's uh, it's a rare uh, i i can tell you the when they met in a year it makes a news particularly 2013 before i can tell you 2012 december ndc came for a meet and then they approved the last five year plan of india at that time we do not know that that's going to be the last five year plan but anyway 2012 to 2017 yeah uh, the period covering this one five year plan it was approved it was in news and then uh, uh, so ndc was going on and one more reason also in that ndc meeting uh, the tamil nadu chief minister then chief minister uh, selvi j jayalalitha walked out of it and citing that this is a constitutional we are chief ministers are constitutional officers but how can uh, you can ring a bill bell when i was speaking so like that and also it, it it was a highly political news it was so naturally who are all sitting in that ndc meeting who are all the members who are all sitting in that ndc meeting and uh, approving five year plan ndc uh, so ndc meets in a year but that year is special because they have approved it a five year plan they are approving it so all these reasons ndc was in news anyway the prime minister yeah that's you know that composition of no no more ndc is meeting but still ndc is name say it is existing the body has not been abolished though planning commission is abolished prime minister is the chairman and then we have all uh, union uh, ministers we have um, and then uh, which means uh, uh, the finance commission chairman of the finance commission no members of the union cabinet is there and then chief ministers of all the states there administrators of union territories are there and the planning commission secretary will be also the secretary to the ndc those persons are there and chairman of the finance commission is not there so which means we have 1 3 and 4 yeah 1 3 and 4 this is the option that's right so the composition was in news it's not a constitutional body but we are the chief ministers are constitutional authority ndc is not a constitutional body at all like that and all us also in news so it this kind of thing there is a ration so after going through all the 20 questions we have uh, a little bit of uh, idea right now i i hope so if a question coming up from local governments you don't want to search search for any rational but if the questions uh, most of the times i can tell you about 60 to 70% of the politic questions in an year they have a clear rational for it it was in news it was discussed in news some reason straight away from the news question can come or from news we have to go to the background of the static questions we have to read questions will come from there likewise 60 to 70% of the questions always every year from polity they come because there is a strong rational for it okay so thank you all